a man faces the electric chair, accused of murder. I wake up every morning screaming, I'm innocent. He was starting out behind the eight ball. With a man's life in the balance, the defense team reaches out to a different kind of expert witness. It was like we just got a phone call from heaven. These are the true stories of real cases and the psychics who help investigators solve their most baffling mysteries. Jacksonville, Florida is a military town and home to the Mayport Naval Station. The 350 sailors and helicopter squadron Light 42 were a tight-knit group. Two squadron mates, Bill and Anita Lukander, had even gotten married. But the honeymoon wouldn't last long. Just a few months after their wedding, Bill ships out to Guantanamo Bay. Three days later, on the morning after St. Patrick's Day, Anita fails to report for duty. For those who know her, this is cause for alarm. Friends file a missing persons report. The initial response to Anita's disappearance in this case was by the local police department. And they didn't seem to take it terribly seriously. Either. Bill rushes home from Cuba to join the search for his wife and makes an ominous discovery. There has been a break-in at his home and several of his guns have been stolen. Police process the crime scene, but find no blood, no fingerprints, no clues. A week goes by. Anita is still missing, and investigators have nothing to go on. The initial hours, and certainly the first day or two, are always critical, especially in a case like this where you don't have a body and the person could be in serious need of assistance. Then. Nine days after Anita disappeared, two local fishermen make a chilling discovery. Something is floating in the intercoastal waterway. Yeah, they thought initially it was a porpoise, and it turned out to be Anita Lukander. The medical examiner determines that Anita had been strangled and stabbed and thrown into the water within 24 hours. Police question Anita's squadron mates and quickly turn their attention to Pete Johnstone, the newlywed's closest friend. Did the bride have a secret? Peter Johnstone was known to be her very good friend, and there was some speculation on their part that he may have had a romantic interest in her. And I was over their house quite a bit, and we do a ton of things together. He hardly seems like a likely suspect until police asked him what he was doing on the night of the murder. On St. Patrick's Day, I uh, did what I normally did. There's these two bars I always go to, and uh, I went to those, I went to the one, then go to the other and walk home. Although they can find no one to confirm seeing Pete that night, police have no evidence to link him to the crime. The case grows cold. Then, eight years later, the Navy Criminal Investigative Service forms a cold case squad and reopens the investigation into Anita Lukander's homicide. Two agents locally had primary responsibility with the cold case squad for it. They were David Early and David Semstrom. Their first task, re-interview Peter Johnstone. I met these two gentlemen in their Ray-Bans, polo shirts and jeans, very beach boy type and very friendly. They introduced themselves as the Daves. But it's clear they have a definite agenda. I don't know what you guys want from me. And within a half an hour, they just stop me and they say, just forget it. You're the one that did it. We know you're the one that did it. Well, were my friends, I would have never heard her. I was like, oh my God, no, I didn't do this. But the Daves are relentless. Johnstone begins to doubt himself. You don't tell us anything. The Navy investigators have him by the throat. If you had killed her, how would you have gotten the body? They help Peter to construct what sounds like a confession. If you were the killer, what would you do? Well, I would assume that the person would put her in the truck and I know where they found the body because that was already pointed out. How would you go straight there? And it's like, well, yeah, I wouldn't think I'd drive around. Two weeks later, they return and arrest Peter for the murder of Anita Lukander. The NCIS agents say that Johnstone confessed to strangling Anita that night and throwing her body in the water. Even though they have no tape of this confession, not even a transcript, they charge Johnstone with first-degree murder. 
That's when I realized I was facing the electric chair. Peter Johnstone's case is assigned to the office of the public defender in Jacksonville. I didn't have much hope at that point. Even his attorneys know they've got an uphill battle. You're trying to prove the non-happening of an event, which is always more difficult. A case like Peter Johnstone is an ulcer-making experience, really it is. The defense attorneys start building their case. It was probably one of the biggest cases that this office has seen. We had a room dedicated for that case. It's a huge task. They begin by revisiting Anita's last hours. And she was last seen, as far as the police could establish, by a co-worker of hers. He had gone to her home and had taken her for a ride. The co-worker says he dropped Anita back home, and his alibi holds. The defense team continues to look for clues, but they're beginning to lose faith. It got uh, frustrating because we weren't really getting anywhere. By that time, a lot of folks' memories had faded or they didn't want to get involved. The trial date keeps getting postponed. By now, Pete has spent almost a year and a half in jail. I wake up every morning screaming, in my mind, I'm innocent. Why are they holding me? Desperate for any kind of break, investigator Mimi Hannon suggests talking to a different kind of expert witness. I thought about perhaps consulting with a friend of mine who's psychic, and her name is Sharon Johns. We need to approach this with a certain amount of skepticism. You know my thoughts on psychics. The lead attorneys are reluctant. I don't see how it can possibly hurt us to talk to this lady. Is she Do charging us for this? No, apparently she's willing to do this no. for free. Free is a good price. Hey, Sharon, it's Mimi. Oh, hey, Mimi, yeah. The investigator decides to reach out to the psychic. It's a homicide. Before Mimi arrives, Sharon has a sudden vision of the crime. Peter Johnstone has been charged with the murder of fellow sailor Anita Lukander and is facing the death penalty. With nowhere else to turn, the defense team contacts psychic Sharon Johns to help prove their client's innocence. Any avenue that might help my client, I'm prepared to explore. Okay. I'm leaving now. Mimi contacted Bye -bye. her and gave her very limited information about the case. Sharon, our defendant's name is Peter Johnstone. OK. He's innocent. There's no doubt he's innocent. The first thing she had said was that Peter was an innocent man. He just got railroaded into this one, because he's, he's a good man. Yeah, he's innocent. What else can you see? The psychic comes um, up with more details. I saw a man with a boxy-looking vehicle, and he had come over to Anita's house to see if she'd like to take a ride in his car. After he abducted her, he realized what he had done, and he went back to the house and made it look like a robbery. I had an image of a composite drawing. He took guns and jewelry to make it look like a, a robbery. There was a robbery. There are guns missing. Well, I know that he tried to pawn some of those guns. There is a composite that was made from one of these pawn shop owners. And that composite is somewhere, and you need to find it. Mimi's not sure what it all means. She takes the information back to the public defenders. She confirmed what we already thought, that a burglary had occurred. Sharon also confirms details about Anita's last evening. Details she had no way of knowing. I see this little boxy car of some kind. It was exactly as police reports had described it. The skeptical attorneys are stunned by these confirmations. Much of the information that uh, Sharon provided, it was almost eerie in that it fit very well our thinking. But why is she also seeing a composite drawing in her vision? Sue decides to comb through the files one more time. And until Sharon pointed the composite drawing out to me it, that it was indeed part of this case file, we would, probably would have never known it existed. The attorneys discovered that eight years ago, someone had tried to sell the guns stolen from the Lukander home at a pawn shop. The pawn shop owner helped police come up with a composite. It's shocking to see the suspect face to face. The composite looked 
completely unlike Peter Johnston. The psychic's visions have given the defense team new energy. Kind of like having a client pass a polygraph. That's not admissible either, but it reconfirms your belief that the fellow you've got is innocent. And that's kind of the boost that it gave us. Sharon's clues are intriguing, but to free their client, the defense team needs hard facts to disprove Pete's so-called confession. Our thinking was that Vanita did not go into the water the night of March 17th as the claimed confession had it happened. They can only hope that Sharon can come up with something to confirm their hunch. She continues to focus on the case. Sharon has worked with police for many years and gets her information at odd moments. When I'm working on a case and someone's asked me to help them, it's like I just don't throw the information off the top of my head, I wait. And sometimes the information comes to me when I'm washing a dish, walking out in the yard, doing mundane things, and then I'll get up and go immediately write it down, the information for a case. You sure? I just take the information and they have to run with it. The psychic has given Peter Johnstone a ray of hope. At the point that Mimi had told me about Sharon Johns, everything shifted at that point. It was all going my way for once. But as the trial date approaches, Pat knows their client isn't yet out of the woods. He was starting out behind the eight ball, accused of a murder, vilified in the press, and with a claim of a confession and what was really a horrible murder. That's a tough spot to be in. When we return, a shocking testimony from beyond the grave. I met Anita Lukander on the phone that day. I found myself in a dark place. In three weeks, Peter Johnstone will go on trial for the murder of fellow sailor Anita Lukander. With a man's life at stake, the defense team builds its case and continues to reach out to the psychic. After we had gotten Sharon involved in the case, we had called her with some frequency. We always had questions for us. Sharon, we're going to try and tape record this conversation to see if there's anything else that you can get. Uh, I don't know if I can channel her or not, but I'll The next the conversation I had with Sharon is one that I will never forget. OK, give me a minute. Yeah, she is showing me that as a friend. They keep yeah, hoping for that one that critical clue that will blow the case wide open. He wanted to take her for a ride in his new car, yeah. He came by the house to pick her up. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, Sharon's voice changed. She began to take on the voice of a little girl. I found myself in a, in a, in a dark place. I was tied up. I couldn't get away. Why, why did you do this? It was not Sharon who was talking. This was another person. Next thing I knew, I was in this, uh, this shack, and I could see through the cracks, but he wasn't there. I was there for a couple of days and, and never could get him to explain to me why I was there. Daylight came. He, he came back. He would always come back. And she walked us through the crime in this little girl voice up to the point that we believe Anita was killed. Now it's done. It was an incredible experience. It just took my breath away. We went over to jail, pulled Peter out of his cell, and white as ghosts, we said, Peter, what did Anita sound like? And he said, you couldn't mistake her voice. She sounded just like a little girl. And as I told them, I said, you look like you've seen a ghost. It was like we just got a phone call from heaven. I wanted to go home. The defenders are shaken, but realize they've been given a crucial new clue. I was there for a couple of days. Now they have to prove it. The information that Sharon furnished us uh, indicated that Anita did not die the night she was taken. The prosecution has based its case on the medical examiner's original claim that Anita's body had been in the water for nine days. I was having a little bit of problem with that, but then Sharon comes along and says, hey, this she was held for a number of days before she died. I knew that she had been held for at least three days. 
Could this be the break they've been waiting for? The body washed up here. Right. With Pete's life in the balance, they must find a way to prove that the original timeline was wrong. We need to check out the crabbing activity in the intercoastal. My co-counsel Ann Fennell and I are great believers in physical evidence, so we wanted to understand that first. We have seen over the course of our uh, homicide experience here, bodies left in the water here, and there generally is a great deal of crab damage to a body. And there had been very little damage to Anita's body. They risk everything on an ingenious experiment. They go to the area where Anita's body was found and bait crab traps with chicken. We wanted to understand how long it may have been in the water, what the currents were, and what sort of crab activity we'd encounter. Two days later, they make a stunning discovery. Seeing up pretty good. As it turned out, uh, they fed fairly well on those chickens, which was in marked contrast to the absolute lack of marine life damage to the body. Their experiment has confirmed the psychic's vision of Anita's murder. Anita had been alive for at least three days. She clearly had not been in the water for the nine days that they speculated. And that made it inconsistent with the claimed confession they got. The defense team can only hope that they have what it takes to break the prosecution's case. Can the psychic help sway a deadlocked jury when we return? The trial in the case of Anita Lukander's murder begins. The state of Florida versus Peter Johnstone. Psychic Sharon Johns has helped the defense team build the case for his acquittal. Some of her observations form the basis for part of the argument we ultimately gave on Pete's behalf. It was quite a lengthy trial. But while we were going through the trial, there was pieces and things that it was like, oh, that was from Sharon. The prosecution describes Peter's alleged confession. According to the defendant, there was an adrenaline feeling there. The person was out of control and inadvertently killed her. The defense denies the validity of the verbal confession. It is not worth the paper it isn't written on. And introduces the crab experiment to dispute the prosecution's timeline. I knew that she had been held for at least three days. During the trial, Sue calls the psychic, hoping for any additional clues. Hello. And Sharon hey, gives Sue. her a crucial reminder. That is when I brought up the composite. They had to use it. She also told me that it was very important to have the jury view that composite drawing. Sharon was very persistent on about that. Sue heeds the psychic's warning. In fact, so persistent that I chose to make a couple of copies of that in case something happened. And on the way to the court, when we got there, Pat turned around and said, I forgot the drawings, and I pulled out the copy that I had made. They make sure the jurors get a good look at the composite drawing. After almost two weeks, the defense no rests its case. No DNA, no hair, no handwriting, no recovered weapons, and no rings. Those are facts you have in this case. After Pat closed and the jury went to deliberate, Everybody assumed this was going to be a very quick verdict. After five minutes, 10 minutes, and half an hour, I was getting scared because it's an hour, two hours, and there's nothing. There was one holdout juror. She just was not convinced by all the facts that Peter was not guilty. The jury asks to see the composite drawing one more time. You've got to take the composite. It's going to be vital. Take the composite. Finally, I was brought out, and then the judge came out. I was kind of a little wobbly at this point. We the jury find the not guilty. So sad at all. The composite drawing that Sharon pointed out to me in this case convinced the jury, in my mind, I'm positive of that, uh, that Peter Johnstone did not kill Anita Lukander. I walked out of that courtroom for the first time in about 21 months. Uh, since I walked outside, I looked up to see the sunshine. It's 
been that long since I've seen it. It was an unbelievable feeling. Great. Really great. Thank you. I would have loved to have been able to just give him a hug then, because uh, it's like he was a part of my life from the time that this started. And, and just knowing that he was free was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. As for what really happened that night, we may never know. For now, at least, Anita Lukander's case remains unsolved. But thanks to the help of a psychic, an innocent man is free. In a bizarre way, she is kind of a different uh, sort of expert witness. Sharon really energized the defense team. I don't think we could have won the acquittal without her. Certainly, Pat and Ann are very skilled attorneys. They're some of the best in the country. But Sharon really gave the entire defense team what we needed to pull this one off for Peter.